invite you to turn your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We're just going to look at a couple of verses there today. But we're going to talk about the, the word justification. Last week we talked about righteousness. So today we're going to use this word. It simply means to be declared righteous. The word has to do with our status before God in relation to his just judgment. Think about this for a minute. The scriptures tell us that every person will ultimately be called into account before God. The so-called secret things of our lives will be made manifest before God the Father, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. He already knows everything about us, but we will know that he knows because it will be declared. Every careless word ever spoken will be included in the judgment according to Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Whether we are saved or lost, we will give an account before God. Paul told the Athenians on Mars Hill that God, quote, commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So all will stand before the Lord Jesus... Now, at first, does that not, I mean, does that concern you at all? I mean, that all of us will stand before Christ at some kind of judgment. Now, there are a couple different judgments in the Bible, but all of us will give account of our lives. So a righteous judge will judge us. We who are unrighteous, he will judge us up against his righteousness. We talked a little bit last week about justification by faith. Justification by faith is an act of God whereby he judicially declares us to be righteous and, and, and he can do that because he places into our account the inexhaustible righteousness of Christ. A righteousness that was both inherent in Christ and earned by Christ throughout his perfect earthly life. Justification is by grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone and all of that for the glory of God alone. So today we're going to look just a little bit more closely at the idea of justification as defined and explained by the Apostle Paul. Here's the text. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Kids, for you and your activity sheets, last week you learned that big word, righteousness. You learned that we don't have any, and we desperately need righteousness if we ever hope to see God. But Jesus made a way for us to be declared righteous by God. This is made possible through Jesus' death. And what else? That one may surprise you. Whose righteousness does God put into our account when we believe in Jesus as our Savior? Third question, once I am declared righteous, the Bible says that I have something very special with God. What is that? And the final question, when we are declared righteous, God allows us to have access to him, and we actually even are said to be able to share in what? All right, so according to the text, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 that we can be right with God. Now, just think about that for a minute. We can be right with God. That is unbelievable. That is awesome. Let's start before the judge for a minute. When summoned to appear before the bar of God's judgment, we will all face perfect justice by a perfectly just judge. There will be no facts or hidden uh, or hidden motives that are, that are left out from this omniscient judge. He already knows everything. Uh, and, and that could be a problem. I mean, think about this in the Psalms, uh, Psalm 130, verse 3. The psalmist said, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who could stand? No time will be needed to establish the fact that there is none righteous, no, not one. That's a serious problem. And in fact, it's a fatal problem. Sin can be forgiven, but what, that does not necessarily undo the sin. I mean, each week in worship, we read a pardon. I don't, one, of, one of these days, I'm not setting you up, but one of these days, it would just be interesting 
to be able to listen to the worship team share with you the pardon, and somebody says, glory to God, just overwhelmed by the fact that God pardons us. I mean, that should at least be in our heart, shouldn't it? I mean, when you think about our sin and, and, and how we are separated from God, but then he saves us and he pardons us, and we read verses like, about there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, we ought to go, Whew, praise God. That's a pardon. And we talk about that, and God pardons us. And, and, and it, we, in those pardons, we talk about being forgiven. We talk about our sins being buried, about being cleansed, washed, blotted out. But even in our sin... Even though it's forgiven, even though it's blotted out, even though it's buried in the deepest sea, it still happened, right? And the consequences of our sin may, in fact, still remain for a time. When God justifies, when he declares us righteous, it means that he does not charge us with what we owe. He does not count our sins against us. If he did, none of us would escape his wrath. But here Paul says something else happens because he justifies us. We are no longer bowed in shame, but we stand before him in grace. So what was it that happened? For those who have been redeemed, we have been justified by faith. God continues to transform us, and he will eventually present us, according to Paul in Ephesians 5, he'll present us as without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, totally righteous. But even perfected in heaven, wouldn't we have some sort of a record that apart from grace we, would, we, would, we wouldn't be able to stand before God? We sinned against a holy God who made it clear that judgment awaits all of sinned. So what happens before the judge? In the words of John Calvin, he said, To justify, therefore, is nothing else than to acquit from the charge of guilt as if innocence were proved. Hence, when God justifies us through the intercession of Christ, he does not acquit us on proof of our own innocence, but by an imputation of righteousness, so that, though not righteous in ourselves, we are deemed righteous in Christ. So what are we saying? Though sinners, God is able not only to declare us righteous, not only as if we'd never sinned, but as though we had never sinned and would never sin again. Before the supreme judge, we are deemed righteous, and that is because we become the recipients of the righteousness of Christ. Now, the basis of our righteousness, what, what, would, what would we say it is? Let's start with the cross of Christ. It, it is, is that the basis for our justification? Well, most of us would affirm that we are declared righteous because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. And that's correct as far as it goes, but that's only part of the story. The cross by itself doesn't fully justify us in this sense. We certainly needed a substitute to pay for our sin. And that substitute we needed to, in order to receive uh, in himself the wrath of God against sin that should have been directed toward us, but there was more to it than a payment for sin. There was also a need for positive righteousness. Could we make the case that we are justified not only by the death of Christ, but also, in some sense, by the life of Christ? Let me explain. You ever wondered why Paul said this in Romans 5? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. To save us, Jesus actually lived a perfect life, fulfilling all the demands of the law, and the righteousness that he gained was imputed to us. He died to pay for our sins, and he lived a righteous life so that his righteousness might be gifted to us. That's exactly Paul's argument later in chapter 5 when he says this in verses 18 and 19. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. 
For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, that's Adam, so by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. So Christ not only bears the wrath of God against our sin, but also he lived perfect life and therefore has righteousness to apply to our account. We can be right with God, and because we're right with God, God promises to give something. Again, back to um, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, what do we have? Peace with God. Now, let's work backwards a little bit. To say that we can have peace with God means that we must be reconciled. There must be reconciliation between God and us, right? In fact, he says in verse 10, later on in the chapter, um, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now we are reconciled, now that, that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. But if there's reconciliation, what does that mean? If we have to be reconciled to God, what does that mean? It means that there was estrangement, right? You can't, I mean, who needs to be reconciled if everything's okay? So there was estrangement between us and God, so there had to be a reconciliation that was necessary. And um, I, I want to I get a handle on this as much, uh, as much as I can. I've tried to share this before, and it hasn't always been understood or received well, maybe. But here's what I'm trying to say. All right, everybody who is outside of Jesus Christ is an enemy of Christ. In effect, everyone who is outside of Christ hates Christ, hates God. Now, I know what you're going to say. It's like, I know lots of people who aren't believers and they don't hate God. And they, they may talk about God, they may go to church, they may have they may, they may do things that they believe are the right things because God is directing them to do so. But ultimately, people who are separated from Christ are enemies of Christ. They are enemies. They are not friends. And ultimately, they hate God. Now, let me see if I can sort of explain this. If God has told us how we are to live, and God has told us what we are like, and God has told us who he is... And we look at him in this great and awesome God, and we decide to do whatever we want. What does that say? We disrespect him. We dishonor him. We think we have a better idea. We think we know better than he does. That's an enemy. That's not a friend. There's enmity between people and God. Listen to this quote for a minute. Imagine the power of God behind his wrath. When you look up into the sky on a clear night, you can see what is called the Milky Way, the name of our galaxy. It has about 200 billion stars in it, they say. You can see maybe a 40 millionth of them on a good night. The disk of the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across, which would be something like 600,000 trillion miles and about 2,000 light years thick. Our sun will take about 200,000 years to make a circuit. Besides our galaxy, there are, some, there are, some estimate, 50 million other galaxies. Now think about that. Milky Way, boom, all these stars. I love it. In, in Genesis, when God is creating, it says, and he created the moon, and he created the sun, and he created all these things, and it just says, and the stars. It's like, what? And the stars? I mean, you know, billions and, and the stars. <laughs> it always takes me by surprise when I read that. Now the God we are talking about here in Romans made the universe with a mere command. God speaks, it's there. All of these billions of stars, all of these planets, all of these galaxies... He simply speaks and they all come into being and he holds them all together by his power. This God is so great that any attempt to portray his greatness falls infinitely far short. If such a great God is angry at us, 
and has such incredible power to back up his anger, then we are in the worst of all possible conditions. Nothing could be worse than to be opposed by the wrath of infinite power, end quote. You, you, you getting a feel for that? When the Bible says that the wrath of God was revealed... That quotation gives you an idea of what God means. No one is at peace with God unless they are justified. But if justified, we have peace with God. Savor that for a moment. That's huge. Now, going forward, justification results in peace with God. What does that look like? Well, Eric shared a little bit of this. Peace with God means a relationship with God. Can you imagine this great and awesome God allows us to know him and to have this relationship with him? Peace with God is permanent. It cannot be taken away. It cannot be changed by circumstances. It does not come because things are going well, and it does not cease because things are going poorly. We often think of peace as quiet, tranquil, the cessation of fighting. It's not really that. Peace with God is the end of alienation from God. Because of justification, we are brought near to God, and he establishes a relationship with us that never ceases. A pastor, theologian in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, said it this way, This peace is accomplished with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through his mediation, his person, his work. We deserve condemnation. We had no way of making reparations, and God makes the reparations in the person of his son. We can't pay the reparations. They're too great. And so he has paid the reparations and he has done all that is necessary to establish peace and to bring us into a, the participation of fellowship and friendship with him. We are no longer his enemies and we, we never will be again. That's peace with God. How, how, do, how do we become to, to that or how do we respond to that? Not only can we be right with God and have peace with God, but this, this is the, the, the next piece of this, which is surprising. Again, Romans chapter 5, listen to what he says in verses, verse 2. Though, I'm sorry, through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope. What's the last part? Of the glory of God. Which means that not only do we have peace with God, but we also share in the glory of God in some way. Justification means a certain hope of future glorification. The glory of God is everywhere in his creation. But perhaps the best place to see the glory of God is in the gospel account of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. Paul described it this way, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So the glory of Christ that we see in the gospel is the glory of God. In other words, God's glory shines particularly brightly through the gospel. When we see the gospel for what it is, we see the glory of God recognizing its immeasurable worth. Nothing is more to be desired than the glory of God. That's why Paul could say in Romans 8.18, 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. All the stuff that we go through, Eric shared his testimony, all the things that he endured, none of that really is anything compared to the glory of God. That's amazing. And some of you have gone through horrible stuff in your life. And when Paul says, you know, I, I consider the sufferings of this present time, and he had a lot of them, not worth even comparing. Practically speaking, no pain or trial or problem or difficulty or challenge would be too great to endure if it brought us to the glory of God. Paul wrote in Romans 8.21, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. I, I take that to mean that we are, we are going to share in the glory of God. In fact, we ourselves will be glorified in the sense that we will be completely separated from any residual effect of sin forever. And we will bask in the presence of a holy God. In the midst of Paul's sufferings, he said, This momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 
According to Romans 9.23, the final goal of all creation, judgment, and salvation is this, to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, end quote. We were made to enjoy the riches of the glory of God. Paul, who perhaps understood more of this glory than anyone, said, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And what do we gain when we gain Christ? According to 2 Thessalonians 2.14, to this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the glory that Paul speaks about. Do you understand why Paul would say we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Justification means a certain hope of future glorification. Um, you've heard me say a bunch of times, like when the psalmist says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. And I've tried to, to make the case that when you go out on a, a beautiful October night and you look up in the sky and you see all those stars, brilliant stars, and you see the moon, you, you look at all that, you don't say, wow, that is such a beautiful sky. That's okay to say that, but that's not the real point. Even to say, wow, God, look what he's done to make this beautiful sky. That's better, but it's even better to note that when the psalmist said, the heavens declare, the heavens are shouting at us, look at his glory. Look at it. Glory to God. That's what he's saying. Our lives, as we are justified in him, allows us to say, look at him. That's what he's saying. That's what we're to be saying by our life. We bring glory to God. Someday, when he glorifies us in heaven, what are we going to be saying? Oh, look at my new body. No, we're going to say, glory to God. And then justification is the foundation for glorification. The entire New Testament emphasizes that is that, that in the consummation, God's own glory will be on full display. In that, he will unveil his glory. To this world, his glory is veiled. Sin has blinded our eyes to the glory of God. Even Jesus Christ, to a certain extent, was veiled in the eyes of the world, though he is the manifestation of the glory of God. When he came in flesh, even his own countrymen received him not. They rejected the true king of glory, but when he comes again, it will be in power and great glory, and everyone will see how glorious he is. The message in heaven will be glory to God. That's it. Now, can you think of anything more incredible than the biblical truth that we who are sinners and condemned to certain judgment could be justified by faith, that is, we could be declared righteous by God, because of the all-sufficient, sacrificial, substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf, and the results of that declared righteousness not only means that we've been spared from certain judgment, but it also means that we have real access to the very presence of God, and further, the enmity that once existed between God and us is now and forever gone, and God welcomes us into his presence in peace, and even calls us into his presence to worship him. Did you get that? He now welcomes us into his very presence in peace. We have access to him by grace. He invites us to come to him by grace. That's astonishing. If, if we ever understand a fraction of that truth, surely we would, it would not be possible to consider it with a nod or a yawn or even a somewhat disinterested acknowledgement resonating from our innermost being would be the appropriate praise and worship and gratefulness for such an incredible and unexpected gift, a gift that will impact us not only now but for all eternity. The separation that occurred between the first human couple and God, a separation that was passed on to every generation since, has been for those who have been justified by faith completely done away with, completely we now have peace with God and access into his grace, a grace that allows us to stand before him and even to share in his glory. Now, if you know Christ as your Savior, 
if you have been taken from death to life, if you have been declared righteous by an by a infinite holy God, and you have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to be absolutely overwhelmed and utterly broken at the same time, exalting in him and overwhelmed by worship. If you do not know Christ, but God uses this to begin to open your heart to understand the greatness of God, the lostness of man, and the great need we have of his redemptive work, then you can cry out to him and he will answer. I remember hearing a pastor one time just say, what do you do if you're lost? What do you do if you're dead in sin? What do you do if you have no life in Christ? What do you do? What do you do? And he said, ask. Ask. Just ask God. Ask God to save you. Ask God to take your sin away. Ask God to make you a new creation in him. Ask. And when you ask, what happens? He answers. And you can be a new creation in Christ Jesus. All that was before that you counted on and trusted in and hoped for, all that's nothing. Now we glory in him. Justified, there it is, declared righteous and granted that righteousness in Christ forever. Father, thank you for allowing us some time to think about the gift of salvation, the amazing truth of your word that tells us that that we can, we are justified by faith in you. We have peace with you through the Lord Jesus. Thank you that we could we could be giving testimony of Romans 8 that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we can absolutely be overwhelmed and in worship by who you are and what you've done in our lives. I pray that you would help us not only get a hold of this amazing truth, but also you'll give us the words to say and the passion to say it to those around us who desperately need to know what it means to be justified by faith. Make us evangelists with the great evangel, the great truth, the great good news, the great gospel of Jesus. That's the only hope for people in our world. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for sharing your glory in the gospel that we might know that, that we might bask in that forever. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us life. In your name, Jesus, we pray.